morning. All right, let me ask you a question, okay? You have to answer it out loud. No, I'm just kidding. You have to be honest. How about that? But you do not have to answer it out loud, okay? Fair enough. That way you can be as honest as you want. Have you ever done something wrong and you knew it was wrong, but you chose to do it anyway? Don't have to answer out loud. It's okay. Don't look at your spouse. What are you grinning at? Don't do that. I think most of us in this room can say at some point in our life, we are probably all guilty of this. Even the man who was known as having a heart after God, David, a man who had God's own best interest at heart, one of the greatest leaders Israel ever knew, yet he fell. And he fell mightily. And we know this, but God still loved him, and God still used him. And I am so grateful the Bible is full of lessons for every situation that you will ever face. And today is no exception. Chronicles. Oh, my goodness. Chronicles was written to teach us how to have a do-over. It is the book of recovery, whether it's from a national crisis or a pandemic, all the way down to individual personal sin. The book of Chronicles is your book of recovery. So go ahead and find 1 Chronicles. Hold your place there. We're going to be in chapter 21. Chapter 21, I'm going to read from the CSB for the most part today. Probably going to read the most scripture I think we have ever put up on the screen. So just be ready to find it. We're going to set the historical context. Remember, context is key. When you look at something out of context or you hear something out of context, remember, that's just hearsay or gossip. Until you go to the source, you need to know the full context. And today we see Ezra, who is teaching a lesson about restarting. If you're not sure who Ezra was, he was a Levitical priest. He was a teacher. And his lesson for us today is about starting over when we have offended God, when we have disobeyed him, when we've willfully or intentionally done something, we get a do-over. Now, thankfully, some of us know about this because we play golf. Anybody know what the term is called in golf? Mulligan. Mulligan, absolutely. Anybody brave enough to admit you've purchased a mulligan? Yes? See, fundraisers know this. We just had our golf charity uh, big fundraiser. It was incredible. And I, tell you, I think about five of us bought about 37 of these mulligans, and that's why we won the tournament. Golf knows the secret. Everybody wants a do-over. Everybody craves this. Fundraisers know that's why they sell them. They sell them. <laughs> Talking with Colin this morning, they buy four or five at a time. They sell them as kits because we love mulligans. And today we learn about the do-over that Ezra's talking about. But here's the deal. When you think of David and you hear about his sin, almost every one of us goes to the big heinous ones that were famous. But that's not where we're going today. Ezra didn't talk about his big affair with Bathsheba. He didn't single out even killing Uriah the Hittite or having the husband murdered. He didn't even talk about the rebellion of his son Absalom. Ezra shows up and he brings a story about doing something that's not even always wrong. I mean, it, is, it is the weirdest thing. See, we love to categorize sins, don't we? Big sins and little sins. You know, we've got the, the nasty nine or the dirty dozen or the, the seven deadly sins. If you grew up in church and you were one of the good guys, you remember hearing your parents say you don't smoke, drink, dance, or chew, or run around with girls that do, right? Some of you know that because you heard that. You get, it's clear cut. There's no question. We hear that. This is black and white. We get this. These are things. But David's sin was way different than these. It's the weirdest thing, guys. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to go out on a limb and say none of you have ever committed this sin. In fact, I'm going to say none of you sitting here or even listening online are even tempted to commit this sin. So what was it? Come back next week and I will... No. <laughs> We're going to look. It is the most bizarre thing what David did. Y'all ready for this? David took a census. He took a census. How dare he? The gall. Can you? Wait, what? He took a What's wrong with taking a census? What in the world? What's happening? Look with me starting in verse 1 and read along and see what happened. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to count. Okay, there it is. Look where the sin originated. Look who started it. Look who incited this whole fiasco. Satan comes up and incites David to count the people, appealing to his 
arrogance, maybe his insecurity to count the people. So David said to Joab, he's the commander of his troops, go out and count Israel from Beersheba all the way over to Dan. And I want you to bring a report to me so I can know their number. All right. What's the big deal? Right? Isn't that what you're asking? First time I read that, I'm like, what's the big deal? I mean, census in and of themselves, they're not bad. God even asked people. We saw that in Numbers. He said, go and get a census of the people in Israel before you head out. In fact, before you went into the promised land, he issued it again. Go count the people before you get going. So censuses by themselves aren't sin, but why was David's? As you read on, you will see David didn't have a good reason to do this. Censuses were a pain. They were expensive. They were costly. And it was really just simply a measure to measure his own greatness. Remember, he wasn't at war at this point. He didn't need to know how many fighting men he had. He just wanted to know maybe so he could proudly pat himself on the back. And Satan was stirring up this this agitation. And Joab, a faithful, loyal commander of his army, knew there was no good reason for the census. So Joab, in verse 3, goes up and says, David, my lord, my king, why are you doing this? We don't need to know this. Aren't aren't the whole of Israel your, your, your servants? Just count them all. You've got them all. But David prevailed and said, no, I want you to go and I want you to count them. So Joab left. He didn't agree with it. He went out and he counted all the people. He counted over a million, hundred thousand who could fight. And Judah alone had 400,000 armed men. But he thought this was a detestable thing. And in verse 7, you see the command was also evil in God's sight. So he afflicted Israel. So what did David do next? How did he respond to that? Check it out. To his credit, verse 8, David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. Now, please take away your servant's guilt, for I have been very foolish. Anything odd strike you about this as you look at this? A lot of theologians, when they look at how David first responded, it almost comes across as if David knew this was coming. Almost as if this was a a prepared response, like, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and he will because God is gracious, and God is loving, and, you know, it's wrong, but God's a God of love, right? And he'll forgive me. Now, thankfully, today, Christians don't ever think that. We don't ever go ahead with something we know is wrong or sinful. Knowing and trusting and hoping to fall into God's graciousness. There's just one problem here. David wasn't living after the cross. This is Old Testament. This isn't New Testament. The cross hasn't happened yet. The cross paid for our sins. But before that time, God is a God of justice. We know sin has to be dealt with. Jesus pays for our sin permanently as that once and for all beautiful sacrifice on the cross, but the cross hasn't happened yet in this story. So David's sin has already been, now David's sin has to be dealt with. He has to deal with it now. And look at verse 9 to see what God says. He says this, then the Lord tells Gad, David's seer, your Bible may even say prophet, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am offering you three choices. Choose one of them for yourself and I will do it to you. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I mean, can you, you think David swallowed hard at this point? Think about, look at that last line. Choose your punishment, and I will, do, not for you, I will do it to you. Gulp. Look what David says next. Verse 11, so Gad went to David and said to him, okay, this is what the Lord says. Take your choice. Three years of famine or three months of devastation by your foes with the sword of your enemy overtaking you or three days of the sword of the Lord. A plague on the land, an angel of the Lord bringing destruction to the whole territory of Israel. Now, (laughs) decide what answer I should take back to the one who sent me. Can you imagine Look at these options. This is horrible. Talk about a lose-lose situation. And there it is. Sin always causes pain. Always. And so paying for sin is always painful. And if you forget that, look at the precious nail-scarred hands of the Lord who took our sin. Look at the pain. Look at at what the cost. If you were David, okay, let me just ask the, the question here. What would you pick? If you had the choice between famine, war, 
or plague? What would you pick? I mean, it, it's a lose-lose situation, isn't it? All right, let's see what he chose. Look at verse 13. Keep reading. David answered Gad, I'm in anguish. Please, let me fall into the Lord's hands because his mercies are very great. But don't let me fall into human hands. Can't we humans be so mean? We can be so filled with anything but grace and love. Look where David chooses to fall into the hands and the mercies of God. Verse 14, so the Lord agreed. He sends a plague on Israel and 70,000 Israelite men died. Then God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But when the angel was about to destroy the city, the Lord looked and he relented concerning the destruction. And he said to the angel who was destroying the people, enough, withdraw your hand now. The angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. You know what the threshing floor is? It's that place, it's a windy place. Farmers love to come and they bring their, their grain and their wheat and they have this pitchfork and they throw it up and the wind will blow away the chaff, right? A little pruning here and only the good grain will fall back down to the earth. All the loose stuff is blown away and all the good stuff remains. And the farmer can then just gather it up and it's right there. It's a beautiful place. It's a windy city. It's a windy part on a hill. That's the threshing floor where Ornan is, okay? By the way, it's also where the temple will be built. It's also where Isaac would sacrifice. You'd see that whole thing with Abraham and, and the, the lamb would come. Into, uh, incredible. It's a whole other sermon. Maybe we can get to that. Verse 16. So David looks up and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven with his sword drawn and his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. David and the elders covered in sackcloth. Don't forget that. Look at the level of repentance that's happening. You ever worn sackcloth? Oh, it's awesome. You should get some. And he's sitting there. They're covered in sackcloth. They fell face down. And David said to God, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wasn't I the one who gave the order to count the people? I am the one who has sinned and acted very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Oh, Lord, my God, please let your hand be against who? Me. Don't, don't miss what's happening in his heart. And against my father's family. But don't let the plague be against your people. Verse 18. So the angel of the Lord orders Gad, go tell David to set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. David went up at Gad's command, spoken in the name of the Lord. And Ornan was there. He was threshing wheat. We just talked about that. And when he turned and saw the angel, him, his four sons who were with him, they all hid. And David comes up to Ornan. And when Ornan looked and saw David, remember, here's the king coming up. He leaves the threshing floor and he bows low to David with his face to the ground. Then David says to Ornan, give me this plot. Give me this threshing floor so that I may build an altar to the Lord on it. And give it to me for the full price so the plague on the people may be stopped. I love Ornan's response. Check this out. He looks at David and he says, take it. Take it, my Lord and my king. Do whatever he wishes. Look, I even give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, the wheat, the, the grain offering. Every, I give it all. Check out King David's reply. Very revealing. He says, no. No. I insist on paying half price. I have a coupon. <laughs> right? Does he say that? I insist on paying full price. Do you see what's happening here? I won't take for the Lord what belongs to you. And I'm sure not about to offer a burnt offering that cost me nothing. So David gives Ornan a coupon good for a back rub. No. He gives him a couple Happy Meal coupons. No. No. He gives him 15 pounds of gold for the price. Do you know what that averages today? At the spot price of gold, that's like $350,000 he gives him for this plot of land, full price. Then he builds an altar to the Lord there, and he offers burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. And he calls on the Lord, and he answers them with fire from heaven and the altar of burnt offering. And then the Lord speaks to the angel, don't miss this. Put your sword back. I love it. Can you picture it? The angel's holding it back. He's waiting. Remember, he hadn't moved. He just said, hold fast. Sword's still drawn. Hands still outstretched. Put your sword back in its sheath. 
At that time, David offered sacrifices. There where he saw that the Lord answered him at the threshing floor of Ornan. Why does Ezra want us to know this story? You know why? Because it's our story. This is a story every one of us can relate to. It's a do-over story. We can all cherish this. Like David, we've all done things that we know were wrong from time to time. How'd you handle it? Maybe we've never been tempted to commit adultery or murder. But dare I say we have been tempted to commit things that maybe we call little sins? Is there such a thing? Is that biblical? Look at this. Sins maybe we knew were wrong we did them. Maybe God told us they were wrong in his word, or maybe the Holy Spirit convicted us, but we went ahead and did it anyway. See, Ezra is reminding us here that seemingly little sins matter, and they must be atoned for. Little sins can create great pain and sorrow, like this one here. 70,000 men lost their lives because of one man's decision. Ezra has so much. He's teaching us so many lessons. He's teaching us about forgiveness, what it looks like, what happens when we repent. Ezra's teaching us about the costliness of sin, one man's sin, which really didn't even seem like that much of a big deal, did it? I mean, come on. Compared to having his husband killed and, and, and taking another man's wife versus calling for a census, look at, look at what is happening here. I think sometimes we think what we do in the privacy of our own lives or what we do with the privacy of our own bodies or what we do in the privacy of our own minds is just between us and God. We say, it's, it's just a little sin, right? I mean, nobody's going to get hurt except maybe me. But you know what? That's my choice. And besides... God loves me. So I can just go to him, confess it, and you know, he'll let it go, right? Hopefully, maybe without any consequences. <laughs> right? Besides, David's sin, come on, it was small. It wasn't that big a deal. It was personal. But look how costly. God looked at him and he says, okay, David, you did what you want. Now, I have a choice for you. Three years of war. Or... Three months of famine or three days of plague. Choose your punishment. Y'all remember Ghostbusters? Every time I read this, I think of that scene where it says, choose the form of your destructor, right? And sure enough, you can't help it. It's just got this thing. It's like, oh, I couldn't help it. It was just a childhood memory. It couldn't hurt anybody. What? What'd you do, Ray? <laughs> what just popped in? Stay put, Marshmallow Man. This is what I think of. He's looking at him. He says, choose the form of your destruction. God gives David a choice because he wants David to take responsibility for his actions. So David, you pick the retribution. Does that sound familiar maybe growing up? Anybody have parents that when you did something wrong and your parents found out, it was, oh, it was on? Like, you just wait till your dad comes home? There was nothing more terrifying than the sound of a leather belt rapidly escaping five belt loops from your dad's dress pants when he came home from work. You know what I'm talking about? The only thing that might be worse is when he looks, he says, son, what do you think we should do about that? Choose your punishment. This isn't like a happy thing, like choose your own adventure books. This is one of those things where you're like, what do you mean choose? Like, well, you can have the belt, or if you want to go out in the yard and pick a switch, that's your choice. Bring it on in here. You know, you try to pick like a log, like, <laughs> so it doesn't hurt. My parents got wise. I don't know about you, but my mom, she was just a little, just a wee little. She had three big boys to keep it, and we, we, we deserved everything we got and then some. Well, there was a precious childhood toy. It was an innocent toy. It shouldn't hurt anybody. But in the hands of a parent, it became lethal. And it was this flexible orange Hot Wheel track. Oh, my goodness. Some of y'all know. Maybe you can identify. Here's to you. This right here, you know the problem with these? Besides the fact that you never want to play with them again, they could be hidden anywhere. I remember we would hide these from mom so she couldn't discipline us. You know, she'd always have one. We were in the car, goofing off, jerking around with each other, doing stuff we shouldn't have been doing. Getting on their nerves. I think we're headed to Disney. I think we're leaving Titusville, Florida, head toward Orlando. The longest drive on the planet, it felt like. And she's like, if you don't knock it off, I'm getting a Hot Wheel track. And we would, we would look at our brothers and be like, did you take it? You hit it. Yeah. We knew she didn't have a Hot Wheel track because we stole it. We took it and we hit it. So we're still going, going on. Obviously, I'm telling you, I'm warning you. are like, okay, Mom, right? 
Sure enough, we pushed it one more time. Fling! Out comes the orange hot wheel track. We looked at each other like, you said you hit that. How did you do? She's got powers. It's a, it's, she's doing some kind of magic. She pulled it out and she'd be like, oh, pow! And we were, I'm so sorry, right? She, she had ways. Like, it was, she's so good. Like, we could say, oh, we're hungry. We're crying. We're like, can we, oh, there's Burger King. We got it. I want a happy meal. And she's like, nope, I got you covered. Foom, out from under the seat, she pulls out a pot roast, right? <laughs> And if we complain, oh, we didn't want that. No, no, I got a crock pot of mac and cheese right here and a filet mignon. What you need? You want some chop suey? Done. I mean, it was a miracle. Aren't moms awesome? She's watching. Hi, mom. She, this, is, this is what it was, right? When I think of this, David has a choice, right? And he's looking at these three options. Is he picking the Hot Wheel track? He chooses the option, though, that allows for God's mercy. Notice what he says. He says, I would rather fall into God's hands than man's hands. Amen. So the plague starts, and the people die, and the numbers mount. And David realizes the magnitude of his sin, and he says, I did this. I caused this to happen. Look at what's happening to David's heart. Look at the softening. David's heart is a roadmap here of what Ezra's just got, a roadmap to like a redo, a restoration. And he's used this story here now to show how we can be reconciled back to God when we have deliberately disobeyed him. And it is a beautifully simple process. Ezra outlines, seriously, four steps. This is what I want to leave you with today. So if you're a note taker, take these down. I'm going to break them down into four little things that you can take with you. The first thing on Ezra's roadmap to a redo is this. He encourages us first, flat out, Admit your sin. This is it. Own up to it, right? Admit your sin. Look what he says, verse 17. Wasn't I the one who gave the order to count the people? Think about what he's doing. He's saying, this is my fault. I caused this. I owned it. Y'all, that is a big boy statement. People don't like to do that, do they? I always want to blame somebody else. I always want to pass the buck. The lesson here, here's your truth grenade for the day. God relents when we repent. And thank God that's so true. God relents when we repent. That's the principle here that Ezra's saying. He relents. He pulls. Remember what he did to the angel? He said, stop, hold off, hold fast, pull that hand back. Aren't you glad God still has mercy? Aren't you glad on this side of the cross that he gives us mercy at the cross when we sin? See, we don't like to admit this, but our effects are now set in motion from our unrighteousness, from our sin. This is not popular today. The way we have to deal with this starts by admitting that you did that. You caused this. Well, that is tough, big boy, big girl things to do, isn't it? Look what the second step Ezra tells us to do. He says, then you take responsibility for your actions. Did you sin? Are you the one that hurt somebody? Are you the one that gossiped and slandered? Didn't go to the source? Are you the one that stole something from somebody and you didn't make it right? You're the one that maybe fudged a little bit on your taxes or your driver's ed log book for your hours. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to move on. You have to take responsibility for your actions, church. We're called to walk in righteousness. Look at verse 17, the second half. He says, Lord, my God, please let your hand be against me, against my father's family. Don't let this plague be against your people. Did you see what changed? I bet you missed this because I did too the first time I read it. See, before the plague comes, check out what David's heart is. David says, please don't let me fall into human hands. But after the plague starts, look at what changes. He says, Lord, let your hand be against me. That's repentance. That's big boy ownership saying, I agree with you on the hideousness of my sin. Every redo begins there, taking responsibility. We have to own what we've done. We have to be willing to shoulder that responsibility for the harm and the division we have caused. But it's Ezra's third lesson. Whew. After we accept responsibility, that is the doozy. Step three is you make things right. With people, you go to them. With God, you go to him. Look at what he does here. So we already know that we start by admitting our sin. We already know that we start by taking responsibility. But what do you do next? 
when you're dealing with a holy God who is, dwells in unapproachable light, what do you do next? David didn't know. And sometimes I get it. I've been there. What more can I do, Lord, to show my remorse? What more can I do to show my repentance? Guess what? In this illustration, God tells him, follow this closely, okay? Look closely because there's a lesson here. Look at verse 18. So the angel of the Lord orders Gad, go tell David to set up an altar of the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. You see what happens? God tells Gad, you need to go tell David, set up an altar. Why? I mean, let me ask you, is that hard? Is that hard for David to do? I don't think so. He's a king. He's got money. He's got servants. How hard is it to cut some wood? He could build the rocks. He could build a platform. He could, he could set up an altar. He, he, he could do all those things. And, and I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, why, why would he do that? He could have this accomplished in a matter of hours. Okay, look closely. Look at verse 18 again, okay? There's a hidden gem here. The angel of the Lord orders Gad, go tell David, set up an altar to the Lord. Where? On the threshing floor of Ornan. All right, let me ask you a deep question. Do you think when God asked David to set up an altar, do you think just maybe he intended David to do something else? Because he doesn't tell him to do anything else. This is so good. This is going over some people's heads. Some of your eyes are lighting up. He doesn't explicitly tell him to do anything more. But I have to wonder, am I looking at this, is God maybe hoping, maybe expecting David to do something more? I wonder if he's hoping that David is going to take that next step on his own and open his heart and make the sacrifice. Now, this is probably the most important lesson of Ezra's whole chapter here. He's teaching us what to do when we've disobeyed God, when we've pushed him away and said, I appreciate what you say, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do my thing, right? He's pushed him away, and, and we're, we have this moment where he's about to show us how to restart when we've sinned, right? No matter how minor we may think this is. See, here's the spoiler alert. If you haven't read the rest of the chapter, David spends the next umpteen verses doing so much more than building an altar. He buys the whole field. He buys the wood for the fire. He buys the oxen for the sacrifice. And he doesn't accept them as gifts. He buys them at full price. Who does that? The guy came up and said, no, take them. They're gifts. And he's like, I'm not doing that. Think about that. $350,000 at least for this. Don't miss that. Ezra is showing us that once David comes around to owning up to his sin and taking responsibility for it, he not only does what God asks, but he does more than God asks. So you ready for the secret? If you want to be close to God, be obedient. Do what he asks. But if you want to be really close to God, do more than he asks. Go beyond. Look at the generosity. Look at the remorse. Look at what he wanted to do. Do more. And that is the final lesson I want you to take today. Do more than he asked. See, there's a reason why David stood out. There's a reason why 3,000 years later, we still talk about him as a man whose heart is bent in after God's. A man after God's own heart. Think about that. David, more than anything, wanted to please God. So you know I got to ask, how you doing with that? When people look at you, do they think, oh, you know, I may not agree with everything I do, but look at their heart. They have a hunger. For the Lord God. Look at that. Man, I want to be known as a man after God's own heart. That's the most precious thing in the world to him is wanting to please him. He sets up the altar. He offers a sacrifice. He pays full price for the animals, for the wood. He even buys the whole field and makes a sacrifice. This is when I really, 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 really want to be like David. Not on the bad news, right? I want to be known as a man after his own heart. Look at how this comes full circle. See, the story starts with David in full-blown sin, but it ends with all of us wanting to emulate him. Think about that. What a terrific do-over. Years ago, I had the honor of hearing Lynn Rumley sing the last song I would ever hear her sing on this side of glory, Alabaster Box by C.C. Winans. Some of you may remember that. Powerful song based on a powerful story found in Matthew chapter 26. 
In fact, we're going to do something different. I'm going to go ahead and have the instruments come up. We're going to, we're going to park the plan right here. I want to share this story about a woman who comes to Jesus and pours out an expensive box full of bottle that they have to break open and anoints Jesus' head. This alabaster bottle of perfume was so beautiful and so exotic, it was kept in a jar that you had one use. It had to literally be broken, and it was not, you don't save it for later. She poured it out over his head, and this was so exotic, so, so beautiful, so aromatic, it was rumored to have been worth $50,000 in today's money. $50,000. Some say it came all the way as far as India. And transportation back then wasn't cheap. And one of the disciples had the gall to look at her and say, oh, I don't like that. What a waste. We could have used, we could have sold that and used it for the poor, right? I won't even mention the disciple's name who said that. That's a side sermon by itself. Think about this. Think about this lavish act of love. And Jesus rebuked that disciple, by the way, saying, this woman is doing the right thing. She is doing a noble thing. And he accepted this lavish gift because he knew he was worthy of lavish gifts. Plus, he knew she was anointing him for his burial in just days. And they missed it. Not only did they miss it, they questioned it. They questioned the mission the whole reason Jesus came, he was about to die for my sin and for yours. And they had the audacity to go, mm -hmm, I disagree with that. We should sell that and use the money for the poor. Unbelievable. And the mercy and the grace that Jesus, see, this is, what, this is what's so disheartening to us. It is so easy for us to rationalize and, and try to say, you know what, I'm going to be frugal with God because, you know what, he doesn't really need anything, right? He owns everything. But look at this story. The words of the song say, you don't know the cost of my alabaster box, but the Lord does. And I am doing this as an act of worship. I am keeping the main thing the main thing. I am going to love him lavishly, and I'm going to hold nothing back. See, David isn't going to do the minimum here. He could have just built the altar, guys, and walked away. You know he could have. That's all the Lord told him to do. But he said, that's not good enough. And he took ownership, and he moved forward. See, God is touched when we love and we act lavishly toward him. Look at verse 24 one more time. He says, I insist on paying the full price. Wow. Ezra is writing to the people. He's writing to us today. He's telling stories, reminding them of things they never want to repeat, but he's also telling things that we need to emulate and we need to be following in this example. This is a do-over story for the ages, for us to imitate. As we go through life and we see hurting and broken people, man, let's avoid sin as much as we can. But if we do sin, whether it's something we think is big small. Man, let's follow David's example and respond to it like he did. Let's thrust ourselves on the mercy of God and say, I have sinned. We admit the sin. I take responsibility for it. Do what you must. Tell me what I can do to make up for it. And then do more than make up for it. So what's God speaking to you today? I see a lot of new faces and I want to mention something. We, we like to open the altar at the end. We're not in a hurry. We're not rushing through this. This is your time to respond to God. This is the highlight. This is when we get to pray. Say, God, deal with me. What's God telling you? We'll open up the altar in a minute. We'll stand. We'll sing a song. No one will bother you. If you want to come intercede, maybe for yourself, maybe you need to throw yourself on God's mercy and repent of a sin. Maybe you need to pray for a lost neighbor. We woke up this morning at 730, walked out our door, and across the street, we confronted a sight we thought we would never see. A gurney with a lady on it with a sheet over it being pushed into the back of a funeral home car. I got young kids. They looked at that and said, what's wrong? I didn't have a chance to talk to her about the Lord. See how sudden it is? That was today. You need to make it right. Maybe you need to make it right with the Lord yourself. Maybe you've never asked the Lord to be your Savior. 
Maybe you've never come to the place. You can't look back at any time in life and say, you know what? I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. God, will you forgive me? Holy Spirit, will you invade my heart? Will you take over? Do that now. Today is the day for salvation. We've been baptizing people, young children who have come to know faith in the Lord. And we've got another one who made a profession of faith just this week that we'll be baptizing shortly. And it's just to see God move. So it should stir our hearts. We should repent of our sin. Somebody here is holding back. Maybe you want to pray for your family. Maybe you want to pray for a job situation. Maybe you know somebody who's hurting. This is your time. God is here. He's spoken through his word. What's your response? Let's stand together. The words will be on the screen. The altar is open. We can worship, stand, sing, pray. Just be obedient to what the Lord lays on your heart.